you mentioned that this was a topic of your undergrad research was the abduction of, I think, yes. 13 uh, people yes. uh, from basically North Korean agents within Japan to bring back to North Korea. Yes. And as far as I know, or I read the idea behind this was they wanted uh, Japanese speakers to teach uh, young North Korean students Japanese so they could potentially have spies in the future that uh, master the language. Can you explain a little bit what happened when and what were the consequences of this? Yes, so this began in the 1970s on the auspices of Kim Jong-il, who was the son of Kim Il-sung, the, le the first leader of North Korea at the time. And the idea was that uh, North Korean spies would abduct not just Japanese people, but foreign nationals from across the world to bring them to North Korea to teach their own spies language. So uh, they would abduct Japanese people and bring them to North Korea to teach them about Japanese language and culture. Though there is something interesting where, as I mentioned, we have all these people that uh, went voluntarily went to North Korea from Japan. So it's been questioned why they would want to like get them specifically to come to North Korea. Well, this program, it goes beyond just language and teaching language and culture. They also wanted to breed new spies too. So the idea was is they would abduct people and have them basically force them to marry each other and have children. And then their children would be raised under the North Korean regime. So you can imagine uh, Eurasian people with Eurasian features, but they speak Korean fluently and they're totally loyal to the regime. They would be the perfect spy to go to other countries. And it sounds like a wild conspiracy theory. And for the longest time, it was dismissed as such. But in 2002, Prime Minister Jinichiro Koizumi met with Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-il publicly apologized for uh, abducting these Japanese nationals. And uh, another thing related to that is I actually uh, met Charles Jenkins, who was an American soldier that lived in North Korea for 40 years. He was one of these American soldiers that voluntarily went over to North Korea in the 1960s. Uh, in his case, I think he wanted to avoid the Vietnam War draft. But uh, the person he married was actually one of these Japanese abductees. So when she was repatriated back to Japan in 2002 as a result of the summit between Koizumi and Kim, uh, Jenkins and their two children a couple years later also came to Japan as well. So from him, we know a lot about uh, the testimony of like what this program was about and he truly believes that his daughters were being groomed to be spies for this regime because in, in his memoir he mentions how when uh, he brought his two daughters to Japan it was it took a, quite a long time for them to kind of unlearn the indoctrination that were born into so stories like this it's really fascinating it sounds like something straight yeah, up like I, I want to just dive deeper yeah. into this because I'm, I'm very curious I mean we we hear so much about yeah. North Korea. And then sometimes, occasionally, uh, at least maybe before COVID and uh, before uh, the incident of an American student uh, yes. uh, dying, basically, as a cause of the detention he had in North Korea, some YouTubers or video creators were able to go to North Korea and film things, right? Yes. So we've seen certain things, but we know it's all very curated. So mm -hmm. what is it like, you know, when someone actually lives there for 40 years? Yeah, well, he has a very rare experience because uh, besides him, there were a few other American soldiers that went to North Korea. And uh, there's a bit of a misconception. A lot of these people think that they, they were like communist sympathizers. They went there for ideological reasons. Most of these were just people from very poor backgrounds from the, the rural South of America where, uh, you know, didn't have really good education. They didn't have many good prospects. They were having disciplinary problems. So um, in those days, um, yeah, North Korea's the, the propaganda, uh, you know, the Cold War propaganda would have said North Korea is a scary country. It's a communist dystopia, which is uh, true in many sense, but like these American soldiers wouldn't know any better. They just wanted to like leave their duty. And the idea was if they went to North Korea, they would be taken to an embassy and then sent back to the US, which is, you know, a very harebrained scheme in retrospect. But, you know, this is the 1960s. You don't mm -hmm. know that much about what's on the other side. So, uh, yeah, so basically for the next few decades, these American soldiers, they lived in North Korea. They taught English to spies. A few of them even appeared in a few propaganda films where they played the evil American uh, villains in these movies. So they became sort of these micro celebrities in North Korea. But Charles Jenkins was the only one to actually leave. Uh, two of them died of natural causes. Uh, one of them, James Dresnock, who was the subject of a documentary called Crossing the Line. In this documentary, he kind of professes loyalty to the regime. But it's really hard because if you're being filmed in North Korea, of course you're going to say whatever is convenient for you. Of course you're going to say that the regime is a, good th is a good thing. Whereas Jenkins, because he left North Korea, he had the opportunity to be more honest and to tell the world what he saw and what he experienced. And um, I met him in August 2017. I went to uh, Sado Island, which is off the coast of Niigata Prefecture. He was working at a history museum for the time. And uh, just four months later, he passed away. But I was able to interview him and get his story down. And that became uh, the subject of an article that I later wrote for NK News. Wow. Yeah. You said that for those 13 abductees, uh, Kim Jong-il apologized in 2002 yes. uh, following a meeting with uh, former Prime Minister Koizumi. I read uh, that 
some of the bodies were repatriated yes. uh, to Japan and DNA tests were conducted and apparently okay. some of them did not match the mm-hmm. DNA of the people. So basically hinting to the fact that North Korea sent just random bodies to yes. Japan. Well, yeah, that was a huge controversy. There was also a controversy of like how well these samples were actually analyzed. Some uh, believe that they were contaminated when they were being analyzed. But this is a thing where uh, this is why the abduction issue is such a huge quagmire between Japan and North Korea. It seems that no matter what North Korea provides, Japan is never going to be satisfied. But at the same time, we do know that North Korea has lied about many things before. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned 13. There could actually be way more than 13, too. The uh, J- official national of uh, Japan's police agency, they report hundreds of missing people. And there's actually a page on their website that says, you know, people that cannot be uh, removed from the possibility of having been abducted to North Korea. But it's so difficult to prove who actually was abducted, who's dead, who's alive, that there may never be actual uh, solution to this. And the other issue is that there probably is still there probably are still like Japanese people in North Korea that are alive but if they know too much about the regime it would be very difficult for North Korea to repatriate them and uh, bring them back here because in 2002 there were five people that came here it was only supposed to be a temporary visit where they would say see their families for the first time in a few decades and then go back to North Korea but obviously they didn't do that after pressure from the Japanese government and their families they stayed in North Korea and to get their family members, like Jenkins and their daughters, to come back to Japan. They stayed in Japan. They, so they were, these five, they came to Japan first, and then whatever children they had in North Korea were still in North Korea. Mm-hmm. So that was a very valuable bargaining chip for North Korea to have. And uh, it was so because they got tons of rice and aid from Japan as a result of these negotiations, and they sent them back to Japan. But since then, there's been no other people repatriated. It's been like this for over 20 years. And in 2014, there was a summit in Stockholm held between the Kim Jong-un government and uh, Japan, where North Korea promised to have more investigations into this, and Japan promised to loosen sanctions in exchange for that. But the issue was is that this is also when North Korea was conducting more nuclear tests. So at that point, Japan has no choice but to bring back the sanctions. And then North Korea says, well, if you're going to put the sanctions back, we're suspending our investigation, and this is an assault issue. So it's this back and forth between both countries where it's a stalemate, essentially.